Dime.tv The Vampire Bat is monster number 5 in the Castlevania bestiary and is feared as a servant of evil. It is worth 10 experience points and will occasionally drop a potion. Well hello once again and welcome back to Nathan Plays Castlevania Symphony of the Night. My name is Nathan and this is Symphony of the Night for the Sony PlayStation. In the previous episode we played through a little bit of a previously kind of episode within itself. And then we started off our adventure in Castlevania. We're Alucard, we're attacking Dracula's castle because he's our dad and we're mad at him. As you can see, we are level 6, we've spent about 19 minutes on the game, 625 bucks, and we're 10.7% complete. I assure you, that number has a much higher cap than you might think. Ooh, mysteries. Um, so it does also say replay, which means that I've finished the game on this memory card once before. I decided to leave that in place instead of clearing everything off. Because why not? Also, did you know, I don't think I mentioned before, that I'm actually manipulating those loading screens. If you don't touch anything, it'll just wave gently on its own. But if you mess around with the D-pad on the loading screen, it'll kind of undulate in different directions. So the first thing we're doing is heading down. Um, this is the beginning of a winding shortcut that leads back to uh, one of the earlier areas of the game, and we're actually not going to go all the way through it because there's a strong chance it'll kill me. Uh, we're just going to go a little bit ways down and grab one item before heading back upstairs. So we make our way through this kind of neat uh, stained glass area here. The short range of our knife is giving us a little bit of trouble with these boomerang fellows, and we have a new enemy. Creepy mannequin thing. They do, of course, have an actual name. I just don't remember what it is at the moment. And we're only going to get the item that identifies them much later on. So we work our way around. Grab that candle-looking thing, and it's a spirit orb. What exactly is a spirit orb? Well, let's take a look at the relic menu. And it shows enemy damage. That's right, like any good role-playing game, when you hit something, you want to be able to see exactly how much damage it does. And this item will do that for you. It does eight. Once again, there are on-off switches for every relic you pick up, so you could turn it back off if you really wanted to, but, uh, you know, why? Maybe you want that classic Castlevania experience and have no information. So we'll uh, just kind of gloss over getting all the way back up, kill that table one more time, and we're going to head up to the right into the clock room with another little is super annoying little dude the flea man here and you know what that that uh, that knife i need to be able to one shot those guys and the knife just isn't quite strong enough to do that so we're going to have to switch back to the short sword there we go that's more like it wait a moment you seem human, and yet, what do you hear? I've come to destroy this castle. Then we have the same purpose. I'll trust you for now. I'm Maria. Who are you? Alucard. Not the talkative type, I can see. Well, perhaps we'll meet again, if you live that long. Farewell. So that's our first interaction with Maria, and it, well, I thought went reasonably well. This is also the clock, which is very near the heart of the castle. As a fun fact, the time on that clock is linked to your total playtime. So yeah, as you can see, it's 23.03, and if you go back, we're at, uh, it's actually, it starts at midnight. So it's, it's 12.23 in the morning, according to this game. Uh, that might not seem important, but there are certain things that happen on certain cycles, and there are also certain items that are affected by being day or night in the game, which in turn are affected by how long you've been playing the game. So it's it's kind of a neat addition. Again, one of the many, many little touches that this game includes. 
accidentally grabbed the diamond thing there, which I did not mean to do and didn't really realize it, but I decided I would just roll with that. Even though in this uh, kind of diagonal space, it's not especially useful to me. It's very, just very unpredictable is the problem. We have another new uh, sub-weapon that we just picked up there, the uh, stopwatch. It uses a lot of hearts, uh, about 20 of them, but as you can see it stops time completely for about 5 seconds. We also grabbed one more sub-weapon that I don't think we've messed with before. And that is the book, which will uh, fly around you in sort of a pattern, and then zoom off. Sometimes useful, sometimes really not. We come across this blue glowing door that says it is magically sealed. I suppose we're going to need something to deal with that later on. I don't suppose. I know. Haha. -ha. Just being coy. A little dead end down there with another killer table in it. But lots of hearts. We also have these kind of uh, fairly obvious gates in the floor. We're going to have to come back for those as well. Here we have the long, long hallway. And, uh... Some kind of freaky but not especially difficult new enemies. Pretty long throw on that fireball means it's as long as you stay close, you're just fine. Now, a word about magic. So, as I mentioned before, the spells tab is uh, grayed out here in the inventory. That doesn't actually mean that you can't do any spells. It just means that the game, you don't know any yet. Um, you don't, the player. But if you know them, if you know the inputs for them, you can do them anytime, as long as you have the magic points for it. So, for instance, I can do this. And you can see I've taken a chunk out of my magic bar in the upper left corner, and now the spells tab is lit up, because, hey, presto, we did the inputs, and now it's going to let us know that we just did Hellfire, there's the way to do it again. It's MP15, it's 15 magic points, and it transports and fireball attack, just like Dad. In the beginning of the game, remember that? So while you're gone, you have a brief moment to kind of zoom around, and then when you reappear, you'll shoot some fireballs. There's a couple of other spells that I use on a pretty regular basis, uh, especially that one, Dark Metamorphosis, uh, which any creature that bleeds, when you hit it, and you splash that blood on you, will restore health points. This one is very useful. And there's one more that I'm going to be leaning on pretty heavily later on in the game. So as you can see, Dark Metamorphosis is now added to the list. Any spell that you know how to do, you can do, as long as you have the points for them. Uh, there are other ways to discover them. You can uh, find out what some of the spells are later on in the game. But right from the beginning, you're able to do a lot of this stuff, which is kind of neat. Also, don't forget to look for the uh, cheeky eyeball, sort of, poking in the back there. If you look through the back windows when I pass by them, we've got another sort of crazy new enemy here. It's Audrey from Little Shop of Horrors. I think I got that reference right, hopefully. Audrey will stone you, and you have to rapidly uh, go left and right on the D-pad to sort of break out of it, mash buttons and things. It's sort of annoying. There is a very rare chance, uh, when stoned, that you will turn into a gigantic gargoyle statue that is pretty awesome. And with that hallway done, we come to a new area. It's the outer wall, it's raining as you can hear. And we're now way on the, we're gonna call it the east side of the castle, even though north isn't really up. Uh, we're just gonna, we're gonna do that now. That's canon. This is now east. Right side. Fine. So as you can see, it's kind of raining and drumming on the sides of the castle, which is a nice effect. We're gonna head down first before we head up. There is a bottom to this thing. Uh, we're not gonna mess with that guy, because our attacks do very little damage, and his do rather a lot. He's one we're gonna come back for. Yeah, so I'm doing one damage. But we'll get him yet. Here we have this mysterious grating. 
We got our daggers back. That's nice. The rating says mist could pass when we touch it. That's a little bit cryptic. We'll see if we uh, can figure that one out later on. We keep working our way down here into this uh, neat and totally, pretty much totally useless observatory area. A bird lands in the nest that it has made. It's kind of nice. And over on the side of the room, you can use the telescope if you hang out by it and press up. Look out on the waters around the castle and see, uh, it looks like a, like a fairy man there. Interesting. Any chair you come across in the game can also be sat upon. Alucard will get comfy and just hang out there for an indefinite period of time. Again, wonderful little touches that have really nothing... That they don't affect gameplay, they're just excellent that you can do them. So with that, we work our way back up to uh, where we came into this area. There's a vase that's just out of reach at the moment. And we're going to head a little bit deeper in. We've got blue axe guys now. They're different from their green cousins in that... Uh, they they do a different thing when they die, and they're stronger. Welcome to video games, where when you palette swap an enemy, they become instantly tougher. This is extremely common. And we have kind of a grisly scene there, some skeletons in the back, but we're going to save the game real quick. Boosh. Alright, so where are we now? We made our way out to the outer wall, and now we're kind of working our way back inward a little bit, and upward. Some kind of broken out bars there. The music has stopped. The wall fills in behind me. That can only mean one thing. What the, it's me! Yes, it's Doppelganger 10. Most games will save the shadow version of you uh, as a fight until much later on. This game says, well, let's do it in the first hour. No big deal, there's no rules. So Doppelganger 10 uh, has your attacks. I don't know why he's called 10. Perhaps he's level 10, I'm not sure. He uses a lot of your sub weapons interchangeably. He likes to jump, he has a better sword. And he'll stymie your magic attacks every time with skills like turning into what looked like a form of mist that we just don't have yet. That hardly seems fair. It is quite possible to get him into a pattern with uh, jump attacks. It's mostly, it's actually a pretty fun battle. Over too soon. Back to the rainbow dimension with you, doppelganger. If you play the Xbox 360 port of this game, because it has slightly more powerful hardware, that sparkly effect at the end of a boss battle actually comes in at like a normal speed. It is supposed to come in at a normal speed, but the PlayStation wasn't powerful enough. Anyway, we got a Gladius. Gladius? Gla hmm. Gladius. It's a slightly longer reach, better attack power. Just a nice little upgrade to the sword. Nothing major. Made that jump, we got another life max up, and we can watch the little mouse. Looks around and scampers off. The rain has stopped. That's kind of nice. Seems to be some sort of elevator there, but it is not in order at the moment. It's out of it. And working our way up, I paused briefly for a moment to decide if I was going to keep going up, but now we're going to go in. All right, we're doing this now. Another new area. It's the Long Library, with a wonderfully classy soundtrack. And these guys, they're tough. But a couple of well-placed daggers, and you can keep them at a good distance without having to deal with their super long stabby attacks. Also, the daggers are very cheap to use, like in terms of resources. So that's nice too. That guy's still gonna get me though. 
carefully. Timing. There we go. They do have one extra attack, the uh, Skellymans, um, but it is very rare to see in which they call down lightning and become much stronger. So we're going our way out to the side here. We find a bronze cuirass. Let's check it out. Replace the hide one that we're wearing currently. It has better defense, and the only description is bronze cuirass. Well, there we go. I guess not everything can have a story to it. Working our way back to sort of that junction from earlier, we're going to go up, check out that awesome shadow effect on the background there, and we're going to deal with these guys. They like to do speedy zooms in sort of an unpredictable way. Fortunately, they're not too difficult to kill. However, if you are incautious, they curse you. As you can see, I have a little curse now at the top middle of the screen. I am funky colors, and I can't attack. It has no other effects, except that it's just very, very annoying. And that's why we pick up uncursed potions. Drop one of those. And the curse is over. But as you can see, using potions and restorative items is annoying because you have to go into the menu, equip the thing, use it, then go back and re-equip your weapon. Later on in the game, we'll get something that will make that process a little more automatic but for quite a while, it's mostly just annoying. Here we have some magic books that are coming off their shelves to attack us. You know, as every librarian's nightmare, I assume. And that one dropped a thousand dollars. Nice. Didn't have to do that. New relic, it's a fairy scroll. What does the fairy scroll do? As you can see in the lower right of the screen, it says magic tome when I hit that thing. So I'll give you, I'll give you three guesses. Yep, it displays the enemy's name. Good information to have. Just, you know, you want to know. You want to know these things. So for instance, these skelly mans with the, with the swords are called Durons. Take that, Duron, or Duron. There's also Thornweed there. It's fascinating. An endless array of names that I will not be reading all of. Because you can do that. So we continue making our way through the long library across this sort of middle section here. Fairly sedate hallway. It's been a long time, old one. Oh, it's you, Master Alucard. What do you need? I need your help. Young Master, I cannot aid one who opposes the Master. You won't go unrewarded. Really? In that case, just tell me what you need. So here's the shop in the game. Yes, the library houses the shop where we can sell gems that we picked up so far. Tactics is for uh, bosses. You can get some hints about how to fight them. We also have I'm enemy and this. sound list. Um, many of the options uh, that I have for purchase in this area, as well as I think sound test, are not available on your first playthrough. Um, because this is a replay file, there's a whole lot of stuff uh, that we shouldn't have access to yet. The enemy list is where I'm going to be getting the descriptions for that Castlevania creatures, uh, creatures of Castlevania sort of gag that I did at the beginning of the episode. I feel like I'm going to keep running with those. And you can buy stuff. Like I said, there's a lot more stuff in this list than we should have in your first playthrough. First thing we're going to get is the Jewel of Open, which can open locked blue doors that we've already come across. Uh, you can get lots of restorative items, uh, uncurses, that kind of thing, anti-venoms. Kind of moving through the list here. Magic Missile. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff there. But I need a couple of other things here. I do have 2,675 gold, as you can see. None of these... Anything that says use next to the description means it's a one-time use item. Uh, I am going to grab a library card, which allows you to warp back to this uh, spot from anywhere in the castle. That's, that's rather nice. I think the saber 
is going to be a good investment. Mace is a lot more expensive. The saver will let me do something else. Keep a little bit of money left over in reserve. You can also buy uh, swords from much later in the game for a lot of money. And there's some other stuff here. Um, some defensive items. Diamond plate there. A little, little glimpse of uh, some of the things to come. Reversible cape. Oh, and there's the Joseph cloak that I made reference to in the first um, episode, the one that allows you, it's a system menu next to it, and that's the one that allows you to set any color you like. Oh, we're going to grab a castle map, and there's the duplicator, by far the most expensive thing ever. Um, but it, rightly so, because it essentially breaks the game. One of, one of a few different ways to do that. Here are the magic scrolls that will teach you the other spells, and uh, the last one that I'm really going to be into is Soul Steel that I just highlighted I'm briefly there. But I already know how to do it, so I don't need to buy the scroll. Hey oh. All right, so I got the castle map. I can get in the saber. <laughs> I'm going to call you. that a day. Farewell for now. Probably should have trimmed down the footage of that shopping segment. I apologize. It's kind of tedious. The Saber does even more damage than the Gladius that I just picked up. And with that, we leave the library. We just wander back on out of there. I'm going to gloss right over all of that. To make up for the, the time lost on slowly poking through items, I just cut out the entire leaving the library sequence. It was uneventful anyway. So here we face a whole host of different guys. Three shot the uh, blue axe lords, whatever they're called. Here we have the skeletons with guns. This is not a good combination. And must not be allowed to stand. Something floating there behind that uh, elevator door. And we're going to pop into this door here and see what's inside. Loading screen. Is it a new area? Well, sort of. Looks like the secret ending of a Super Mario World level. And there's a scorpion above it. Above it. And we climb inside, a cool magic effect happens, the scorpion changes to a horse. And what does it mean? It means we're back near the beginning of the game. That's right, we've just discovered fast travel. We're going to open this up so that we can uh, use it whenever we want to, coming through here. Grab the heart max up. And as you can see, if we uh, check out the map here briefly, those two, the orange spot next to me and the orange spot up in the upper right are the two fast travel stations that we just linked. We will be finding more and adding them to our network as we go. Uh, the first one's a freebie and just takes you to back to this spot. But after this, uh, we can't travel to the other ones until we find them. And as you can see on our castle map, we actually, uh, because we bought the map, we have a uh, much better suggestion of some of the areas that are available to us. For now, we're going to warp back to the Outer Wall. Back to Scorpion Town there. The symbols above the uh, keyholes are useful for keeping track of where you are without consulting the map every single time. There's a poor fellow over there. Sorry, guy. Hanging by your leg. I'm going to leave that sword lord alone for just a moment. And as you can see, um, there are Medusa heads, and some of them are yellow. The blue ones are just annoying and do a little bit of damage. The yellow ones will turn you to stone. Now that we have the elevator up and running, as I hit the switch there, we can climb inside. Let's grab this power up. It's Soul of Wolf, which is a uh, special thing that... Let's see here. Is it the relics? Oh, yeah, there it is. Transform into Wolf. The uh, top R buttons are reserved for this purpose. I can now transform into Wolf. I can do sort of a Bork there. I can do a speedy zoom that will uh, hit damage enemies if I go fast enough. And right now it's not super useful. Let's take this elevator. Little bit of a safety concern there, this elevator. But it gets us up and down real fast, so that's kind of cool.
All right, so at this point, um, I'm making my way back through the long hallway to... Um, we're going to use the Jewel of Open that we purchased on that blue door that we saw a little while back in the Marble Gallery. I think daggers are... I'm, I'm still standing by them being one of the most versatile and useful sub-weapons. So opening the door, we get sort of a switch. Stand on that and something does a ka-chunk. What does it mean? Well, let's backtrack a little bit here. You may already have guessed, you smart viewers at home, that these gates that we walked over in the floor have opened. There were two of them. This one contains uh, an attack thing and another library card, so I could have saved a couple hundred dollars. Rats. Drat it all. But we're going to head back to the other one. Ah, no! Yeah, there's a real danger when you pick up sub-weapons that are near the edges of the screen or the bottom. If your original one drops off, it's gone. So I'm stuck with the book right now. Perfect. And we get to a new area. Welcome to the underground caverns and the smooth, smooth bass lines. This is Underground Caverns on Music Through the Night. So we're, as you can see, we're going to be working our way down and eventually back around to sort of the starting area of the game again. We're going to be dealing with these jerks. We have a pretty vicious upward attack. But um, thankfully the book is of almost no help at all. So there's a save point here that's rather convenient. We're going to use that, and we're going to save the underground cavern exploration for the next episode. Thank you ever so much for watching. And I'll see you next mission.